Welcome to the Divorce Survival Guide podcast, where we have open and honest conversations about co-parenting, separation, divorce, and the hardest question of all, should you stay or should you go? I'm Kate Anthony, your Divorce Survival Guide, and I'm here to help you navigate some of the roughest waters you've ever swum in and answer some of your toughest questions. I've been to hell and back, and now it's my mission in life to help you get to the other side of this process with your sanity and your heart intact. Hey everyone, welcome back. Today I have with me Grace Casper. Grace is amazing. I'm obsessed with her. <laughs> she became a child of divorce at the age of eight. And ever since then, she's wanted to help families through the process of divorce from the child's perspective. So she's now the most mature and amazing 24-year-old. She uh, runs her business called Divorce Tips for Kids. And this includes posting on social media, sending emails to parents, and hosting her podcast, Divorce, What I Wish My Parents Knew. And it is the first podcast created from the child's perspective. Uh, I am also on her podcast this week, I believe. I think we're coincidentally our episodes are coming out the same week. We did not plan it that way, but I think that's how it's going. Um, so you need to go over there for sure. And she's also author of the upcoming book, Dear Parents, Notes from a Child of Divorce, uh, which comes out this month and you can pre-order right now. So if you go to Grace's website, which is divorcetipsfromkids.com, you can pre-order her book. Uh, and I think pre-order starts today. So that's why we released this episode today. And please go and pre-order this book. It's going to be absolutely amazing. And uh, it's going to just, you know, these are all the things that we need to know. And there are things that I had not heard before um, that you'll hear in this episode and that you will learn in this book. Um, that's why it's really important, right? Like we can do all the work that we want in working with amazing professionals, um, therapists and all of that. But at the end of the day, let's talk to the kids, right? Let's hear it from them. And that's what Grace offers. So without further ado, here's my conversation with the awesome Grace Casper. Grace, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. I'm excited to have this conversation about your book. Oh, yeah, absolutely, Kate. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a dream to be on this podcast. You have plenty of fun guests, oh, so I'm glad to be oh, one. Oh, good. I'm so happy. Thank you. You are 24 years old, and you have written a book, which is just like, come on now. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah. But it's been in the works for like, like you've had this, this idea of this book for over 12 years, right? Yes, that's correct. It's amazing. So let's talk about this book. Like, why did you decide to write this book? And at such a young age? Sure. I mean, obviously it's been percolating in you for a while. So why not? Right? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, the story is my parents got divorced when I was in eighth grade and it was really difficult for my brother and I to travel from house to house. And, um, I don't know, there just wasn't many resources out there at, it was 20, 2008. Mm -hmm. So 2008, not a lot of resources out there for families, um, going through divorce, at least not any that my mom or dad knew no. of. So I mean, yeah, I got divorced in 2009. Me neither. There weren't any out there that oh, I could yeah. find. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, girl. The The scene has changed. Thank mm -hmm. God. But um, when I was 10 years old, I started going to counseling and my counselor started to talk to me about the power of journaling. So one day at recess, I went outside and brought my composition notebook and decided to be like emo. And I wrote down <laughs> um, I wrote down 10 tips for my brother and I from going from house to house. I took them home and showed them to my mom, and she said, oh, my gosh, Grace, you have to show this to your counselor. This is amazing. Mm. And my counselor at the time was an author. Uh -huh. I mean, she still okay. is, but um, she published books back then. So I showed her, and she said, Grace, this is so profound. This should be a book one day. I was really, like, confused by that. I was like, I'm in fifth grade. That's crazy. 
But long story short, we tried to turn then and it just wasn't working out because I was a kid and there's just, I don't know, there's a lot of nuance to it. But fast forward to college and I really felt this thing inside of me say like, you need to finish what what you started and let's like pick up that book again. Mm. So I took fifth grade words and looked at it as I now, I, I finished it when I was 23 slash 24. So like as a 23 year old and thought like, what could I add to this now? And now being a like an adult human, seeing my parents as humans and not seeing them as these people that I put on a pedestal growing up, what could I say to kids? Well, then after going through querying different uh, publishing houses and things like that, my literary agent and I found out that the real audience I was wanting to talk to were the parents. Yeah. So we actually changed the words and made it fit to talk to parents because parents are the ones that set the tone for the home. Mm -hmm. And they're actually the ones that I really wanted to speak to, to say like, here's how you can guide your child Mm -hmm. Mm post-divorce. So the book is called Dear Parents, Notes from a Child of Divorce. And it's based on my 10-year-old voice, Mm -hmm. but it's really written by the current 24-year-old me. So yeah. That's so great. So is it the is it the 10 tips or is it it's evolved from those 10 tips? It's evolved. Mm-hmm. It is evolved. Um the 10 tips are still based within it, but there's 16 chapters now and I've added more things like uh, I talk about dating post divorce and how that is for kids watching your parents parentification mm-hmm. happening and so it wasn't until I was in high school when I realized like oh wait, I am parenting my parents. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Um, and that can happen with any relationship. It doesn't have to be divorce specifically, but I do think that divorce is a good kind of, uh, I don't know, atmosphere for that to happen. Sure. Because it's a great breeding, breeding the, ground for it, right? There, that's a better word. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, because the, the mom, the single mom can't rely on husband anymore and the single dad can't rely on wife anymore. So then they, you know, rely on kids. Um, yeah. And that's kind of what happened to me. And so, Mm. yeah, I talk about that in the book. And I'm just really excited for parents to get a hold of this and to read a book from the kid's perspective. Because from my own research, there's not a whole lot out there from the kid's perspective, um, especially a book. And so I'm wanting to really change the conversation around this with families and help them gain practical tools as to how they can really guide their kids post-divorce. So can we just sort of, I would love to just sort of go through some of the the, the chapters and um, what some of the tips are, because it sounds like, you know, this might be a little bit, from, because it's from the children's perspective, right? It's a little bit different from, say, your average co-parenting book out there, right? So can you give us some of the, some of the tips Yeah, I would love to hear some of them. Sure. So one that I think is unique to, you know, reading a book from a kid's perspective is in chapter four, I have a chapter called send a piece of yourself with your kid. Mm -hmm. And I talk about how um, when I was at my dad's house, I would really miss my mom. And then later in life, when I was kind of a teenager, preteen, I would be at my mom's house and miss my dad. Mm -hmm. Um, and I also talk about in the book of like seasons of favoritism with kids and how kids will lean on one parent during a season and then maybe lean on the other parent during a different Ugh. season and why we shouldn't be upset with our kids for having favoritism sometimes. So important. <laughs> it's so yes. important. Yes. Yep. I remember my son going through that and my and really? his dad got so upset like when he felt like he was kind of, you know, being abandoned and he just wanted me. And I was like, dude, you're the dad. It's going to come back to you. (laughs) But like, let me have my time. (laughs) Just let me have it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And I I talk about how it's, it's, um, when you do that, when you, you know, make comments of like, oh, what about me? Or Mm -hmm. like, oh, that's not fair. It makes the child feel really bad, and then they're afraid to show love to that parent because they're like, well, I don't want to make dad feel bad, or I don't want to make mom feel bad. That's right. That's right. Oh, they're guarding their love instead of giving their love as it should be given, which is freely and fully. Mm -hmm. And so um, 
Yeah, that's one of my chapters is about favoritism. But back to send a piece of yourself with your yeah. kid. Um, I talk about the five senses and how important they are. Um, and I even talk about uh, Gretchen Rubin's new mm-hmm. book, Life in Five Senses, uh-huh. which is awesome. Oh, good. Oh, good. Um, I love her. She's so cool. I got to see her at TLA recently in Austin, and I was like, I'm a big fan. Oh, it was a fangirl moment oh, for me. Fun. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I talk about how out of all five, the sense of smell is so strong, yes. and it's the most elevated status among the five. Mm-hmm. And uh, so because of that, one thing that my mom and I kind of came up with for me going to my dad's house was she gave me one of her old T-shirts that she didn't want anymore, and it smelled like her. Mm-hmm. And in the book, I talk about, like, my mom had this really distinct smell. It was like her uh, Dove deodorant and a mix of, like, her laundry detergent Mm -hmm. and then also just, like, the pheromones that she gave Mm -hmm. off. And all that mix, when I would smell that T-shirt, would make me feel like I was close to her. Mm -hmm. So I brought that with me to my dad's house, and I would um, sleep with that at night, which sounds weird, but it actually was super helpful. Oh, God, no, not at all. Um, (laughs) It's yeah, beautiful. <laughs> but it was it was really good for me. And then later, my dad gave me his Air Force Academy sweatshirt, which was really cool in two ways. One, because it, it smelled like mm-hmm. him. But two, one of my favorite memories with him was going to the Air Force Academy football games. Mm-hmm. And so having that big sweatshirt to on at night and kind of like um, cuddle with just reminded me that he's like my protector and he's there for me. And so. Um, so I talk about the, the importance of sending a piece of yourself with, with your kid. And if that is not smell for them talking about maybe doing something different, like if they, um, I don't know, this is random, but if they love your jokes, then you send them like a text every morning that they're at their dad's house or the mom's house, a little joke that you have, or you can send them a voice memo of a joke that you have. Mm -hmm. Um, but if, if it's your cooking, maybe send them some leftovers that they can bring to mom or dad's house. Um, and if it's your voice, then good thing we have cell phones because mm-hmm. you guys can call each other. Right, and so right, right. I just talk about um, making room for that in a family and how my, my parents did a really good job at leaving room for, for me and my brother to both miss the other parent. And I think that's like, uh, you know, so I think, you know, the danger, I know that I have a lot of listeners who, you know, whose co-parent perhaps might uh, make that difficult for their kid. Uh, right. If they yep. said like, I want to bring something of mom with me to dad's house, like that dad would, you know, would freak out, freak out, you know, and forbid it or whatever it's at that. And that's sad, right? Because then it, they're making that all about yeah. them and not about the kids. Um, right. But I, I think that's a beautiful idea. And it's interesting because, you know, that's an idea or something that I had not actually heard before. And that's, Hmm. that's sort of why I, what makes this book so different and important, right? Is that there are these little things that we as adults are not thinking of, right? But the kids are thinking about. Um, Right. So what are some other, what are some other tips since that one went over so well, but (laughs) with me, with the audience of one of me, um, yes, (laughs) check Kate Anthony's approval. Love it. Yeah. I mean, going off of what you said about the co-parent, maybe not being cool with that. Another tip I have in my book or chapter is, uh, talking about building courage and the muscle of speaking up. Oh, I love it. Yeah. And so I mainly wrote this. I wrote this to the parents, obviously, but I kind of was writing it to the parents saying, like, here's how you can teach your child to build this muscle. Uh Um, Because unfortunately, like, you can't be their advocate anymore at the other parent's house. Uh You can try, but they ultimately are the ones who are going to be there in the moment and can speak up in the moment. And I had to learn this the hard way um, when I wanted my mom to say something to my dad for me or Mm -hmm. wanted my dad to say something to my mom for me. And it's just gets to the point where it's like, you got to learn how to do this on your own. And unfortunately, like it does cause you to grow up quicker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's enabled me to be the person that I am today. And my brother, he's 21 and he's so mature as well because, he's had to learn this muscle too, but it's, it's enabled us to not, this seeps into other areas of our life. Like now I can speak up at work. I can speak up in my relationship with my boyfriend. And so when you, when you learn this muscle through the 
avenue of divorce, Mm -hmm. it seeps into other areas of your life in which it benefits you. And so um, I talk about how if you can't speak up, um, then how is your child going to speak? Uh Uh-huh. I love it. That is difficult. Um, But you are the model. And so um, teaching your child what that looks like and also telling your child that being courageous isn't getting rid of fear, but it's doing something despite fear, which we all know that. Mm. But a lot of kids don't know that. I remember when I was little and I heard like, be brave or be courageous. It was like, well, I can't because I'm so afraid. And I didn't realize that being brave or being courageous was actually, yeah, you're going to feel afraid, but it's doing it in the midst of those feelings. Mm. Um, Another practice that my counselor taught me was visualizing what's the worst that can happen. Mm. Um, And so we would do this thing where it's like, okay, pretend that you did tell dad that. What's the worst that could happen? What would he say Mm -hmm. to you? And it was like, uh, he would say this. And then she's like, okay, let's pretend he said that. What what would you do then? I'm like, I guess I would. I would tell him that hurt my feelings. And then you just yeah. like go down this scenario uh-huh. and you realize, okay, wait, this isn't that bad anymore. And, and uh-huh. speaking up seems this, like this huge mountain. But once you do it once and twice and three times, it gets easier and easier as time goes on. Yeah, that's one of my biggest tips in there is to empower your kids to speak up. I love that. And because, you know, so many of us, I know that a lot of my listeners have these situations where – you know they can't they can't be the one to communicate certain things to their co-parent if, if, especially if it's in a high conflict situation or if there's if there's you know a history of abuse in the relationship right like the other parent isn't going to yep. hear it from you but they might hear it yes. from their kid and there's certain things that a kid should never have to talk, you know, advocate for themselves about, and Mm -hmm. that's just the reality of it. And um, I love what you said that if you can't do it for yourself, how are your, how is your kid ever going to be able to do it? Because it, we really do. There's so many things we learn uh, through being parents that we would Mm -hmm. never, you know, to learn to set boundaries, right? I mean, if you're in a relationship with with a co-parent in which you've never set a boundary, and then you're saying to your kid, hey, you can set a boundary <laughs> with dad. Yeah. They're looking at you, <laughs> you know, like you have six heads. Like, what are you even talking about? This is right. not something that I have, that you have ever modeled to me. Um, right. Right. And so this is one of the reasons. And it's like, where do they begin? Right. How do they know what that looks right. like? And how do you teach them? How do you even yeah. teach them if you don't know? So I think, you know, this is why we have to do all this work <laughs> through this, mm-hmm. through divorce, so that you can empower your kids, so that you do have the experience, so that you do have the tools and you're equipped with the tools to be able to say, to to model to your kids, like, actually, this is how you do it. No, Right. I also talk about how to respond if your child speaks up to you, because mm. like if they're speaking up to you, that's actually such a beautiful thing, even if it hurts, yeah. because it's, it's communicating that they trust you enough to express exactly what they're feeling. Absolutely. And to know that that trust is built between you and your child should be such like a path for a parent and even though what they're saying in the moment might be hurtful like i didn't like how you said that to me mom or dad Mm -hmm. you might be like man i didn't mean to hurt their feelings well at least they had the guts to say that and that shows you that man your relationship with them is a trustworthy relationship where they feel safe to say something because they know if they say something that they're not going to be met with you know like well i didn't know Uh like a fight that's right that's right what do you recommend that they said that we say to them in that Like, what does a kid want to hear when they've said something difficult? I haven't. I'm going to read from my book directly, but I have a sentence Mm. that says, for example, instead of asking, why did you say that about me? You can ask, what am I doing to make you feel like I am mean? Mm -hmm. Beyond asking clarifying questions, I would tell your kids directly that they have permission to come to you with anything that they can always speak up, even if they don't like something that you're Mm -hmm. doing. So instead of like making it identity driven, like what, why would you say it about me? And especially tone, tone is huge. Yeah, yeah. Um, but having a softer, softer spoken tone saying like, what am I doing that makes you feel like I'm being mean? Can you explain that more? Because if they just give out a straight, like you're the worst, da, 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 mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
that could be rooted in kid you know, drama and stuff. But yeah. if they're saying, hey, I don't like it when you text your boyfriend when I'm trying to have dinner with you. That's right. It's like, ooh, okay. Wow. Right. Got to listen to that one. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I think there's also a the act of acknowledging, you know, like, hey, yes. I bet that was that might have been really hard for you to have said to me. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you for thank you for teaching me. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. And I'm so proud of you for speaking up for yourself. Yes. Right? Can you Can imagine, you imagine? If, <laughs> if kids were met with that? Like, even adults, like, imagine you confronted your boss at work. And instead of your boss trying to clean up their act and say, like, well, it was because of this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. Instead, just saying like, wow, thank you for coming to me with that. I really appreciate you saying that. I'm really proud of you for having the guts to say something like what? Yeah, right. That would change the game. Absolutely. Absolutely. I had, you know, I was an actor for a million years and I don't know if this will resonate with anybody, but, um, you know, when you're, when you're rehearsing a play, the director will give you notes, right? The director tells you to do basically do it differently, <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. and as an actor, we're mm -hmm. like incredibly fragile to begin with. So when a director says do yeah. it differently, you know, there's a lot of a lot of times you can be, you know, actors can be defensive or explain it. Well, I was just trying to do blah, 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 blah. And I'll never forget. I was very early in my career. I was probably your age. And I was working with uh, doing a show. And this man, every single time the director gave him a note, he would say, thank you. Thank you. Wow. And then he would just take it and do it. And it was like he was thanking the director for making his performance better or whatever mm. it was. But yep. it was just it was and I took that on. I'll never forget it. And I took it on for all of my future, you know, uh, shows and uh, acting endeavors because I just thought it was so gorgeous. Um, and yes. to me, it just feels the same. It feels sort of the same way. You know, like, thank yes. you. And it's it's a mark of mat maturity and it's a mark of humility. That's right. Because to mm -hmm. be able to to say those things is so like it's, it means you're so secure in yourself. That's right. That's right. I don't need to be defensive. I can learn. Mm -hmm. I can learn from my six year old, mm -hmm. you know, like it's fine. Yeah. Like I am I am not too yeah. proud to think that my my six year old doesn't have a a valid point about how I'm behaving, right? And I want parents to remember, like, I wrote the beginning of this book when I was 10. Yes. And so dismissing your children because of their age just isn't fair. Like, remember, like, I want parents to remember when they, if they can, remember when they were single digits or when they were 10. And when you were that age, like you did really profound and amazing things and kids are smart. Like it's crazy that kids can figure out an iPad at three years Jeez, old. It's kind of scary, terrifying. but also like, uh, <laughs> yeah, they're smart. But they're, they're brilliant. Mm -hmm. I a hundred percent agree. What are some more tips? There's, these are so good. <laughs> these are so great, Thanks. Grace. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. What are some other tips? Um, well, okay. I have one that's pretty, uh, it might rock the boat a little bit for okay, some. Okay, good. But the 12th tip is called, it's not broken, it's simple. Mm -hmm. And um, I talk about how the main theme when you get divorced or when you're a child of divorce when you tell people their response is like, Oh, I'm so sorry. Or what well, was it like growing up in a broken home? Or wow, I bet that was so hard. You probably wish your parents were back together. Right. Huh. Um, and those things <laughs> are so weird First of to all, hear. Like, don't ever say, please don't ever say that to a kid. <laughs> you uh -huh, wish your parents yes. were Let's back just together. Right there. Or don't you like, yeah. Yeah. Oy. Or like, do you ever want them? Like, which I'm like, no, they're like, like the parent trap. I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that. But anyways, <laughs> um, I just talk about how it's so beautiful that my parents got divorced because it actually created a more whole family unit than they were together. Mm -hmm. um, more about that. And I, I got to see more of my parents as their full selves. Mm. So I would say that I saw maybe like 40% of what, who my mom is when she was married to my dad. Mm -hmm. And now that they are divorced, I get to see 
all 100% of my mom. And seeing as a woman and as like her daughter, when I was little, seeing a, a woman um, step into all that she is and her full personality, her full quirks, her full hobbies, it was inspiring as her daughter to watch because I was like, wow, I'm allowed to dream when I get older. I'm allowed to do this when I get I'm allowed to weep. I'm allowed to laugh as hard as I want. Mm. I can be the fullest version of me. But in the divorce, I didn't get to see that side of my mom. She was very robotic and very um, silenced. Yeah. Um, and and my dad, same thing. I, I saw I, what I thought was my dad in the when they were married. And now that they're divorced, I get to see all of my dad. And um, I love seeing all that he is. It, it makes sense why he is the way he is. It explains so much of who he is. I get to see his drive. I get to see his passion and his career. And that's inspiring to me as well. And so I would say that our family became more whole as a family unit with them separating than them together. I love that. I love that. And I love that you had the insight. You are truly, I mean, you're so, you're so mature. It's crazy. Um, because you have the insight. Maybe <laughs> A lot of counseling. Kate. Yes. Good. Everyone hear that? Everyone hear that? <laughs> counseling. Yeah, and so you said your parents got divorced when you were eight and then you were in therapy by the time you were 10. Well, yeah. So I got into therapy, not because of the divorce. Uh -huh. Long story short, I'll just quick dip into it. I had a grand mal seizure oh. the night before Thanksgiving and it was terrifying. Um, and I thought I was going to die and blah, blah, blah. It was happening when I was falling asleep. Wow. So after that, my parents were like, let's wait to put her on meds until she has another one. Uh -huh. So then there was anticipation around like, when is her next seizure? Oh, God. And so when the sun would start setting, like, I'd be like, oh my gosh, it's nighttime. Oh my, God, oh my gosh, PTSD. I'm going to have another 1,000%. Yeah. So I slept in my mom's room after that. And my mom wanted me to get out of her room and like mm -hmm. into more independence. Mm -hmm. So we started counseling to learn, okay, Grace, how do we transition you back to your own room? Let's talk about the seizure, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And then the counselor was so brilliant. She's remarkable. She's, she saw that at the forefront, my anxiety was about having another seizure, but deep down, I had a lot of rooted anxiety about things I saw mm -hmm. when my parents were still together that I hadn't spoken to anybody about. Yeah. Um, okay. So, you know, we cracked that open and it was good. <laughs> But so, yeah, I'm a yeah. fully healed. Now. Yes, <laughs> so you are. You are so insightful, and to be able to understand. Okay, so to, so for you to be able to understand that you got actually to see. You know, I always say that my ex and I brought out the worst in each other, and that when oh, yeah. we got divorced, <laughs> we were able to be our fully self-expressed. I'll speak for myself. I am a much you know, more expressed and, you know, actualized human uh, now that I'm, uh, you know, as soon as I got divorced, <laughs> let's say, I mean, there's been a journey for you to be able to see that um, in hindsight is really, it's just beautiful. And now a quick word from our sponsor. Wait, that's me. I know I have a lot of podcast episodes for you to get through, and it can be really, really overwhelming to try and figure out where to start or to comb through which ones might be uh, appropriate for you, whether you're trying to decide whether to stay or go, or you're already on the other side of the divorce process. Like, how do you know what to listen to? I have solved the problem for you. All you have to do is go to kateanthony.com slash playlist. Answer a few short questions, and I will send you a curated list of podcast episodes to best support you as you navigate these tricky waters. I'll also help you identify where you currently stand on this journey and what's ahead with resources to help you move through this process with knowledge and grace. So all you need to do is go to kateanthony.com slash playlist, answer a few short questions, and you will have your curated list of podcast episodes that will support you wherever you are in your journey. And now back to our show. How do you 
recommend, because it's not like, you know, as a parent, I could say to my son, oh, honey, I know it feels terrible now, but trust me, you're going to see a more full, a more full side of me. And you're going to, you know, be grateful for that someday. Yeah. <laughs> like that's not Don't exact, say, right? that, to Don't your say kid. that to your kid. Right. <laughs> so this is just sort yes. of, is this advice for parents um, that like, someday your children may see it differently than they see it now. Like how does, I guess, like, how is this Mm -hmm. a tip? I think one of the goals of the book as well is to just encourage families that divorce doesn't have the final word Mm -hmm. and that your kids are going to grow and evolve with, with being a child of divorce. Mm -hmm. Um, And so this chapter was mainly to encourage families that right now your kids are probably like, fuck you. Yeah. Right. But when they grow older and they recognize you as people Mm -hmm. who also didn't know what they were doing with their life and, you know, just big kids raising little kids, pretty Mm much, they will learn to recognize that the divorce was actually more beneficial than you guys being together. Another huge marker of it was, it was obvious to us as kids because the, the, the house with them together was like walking on Mm -hmm, eggshells and a lot of fighting. So then to just separate that, it just felt like, (sighs) like Jack and I just felt so at ease at both houses now because there wasn't the two parties that were wanting to fight all the time. So that was an obvious one as to why the divorce was a good choice. Mm. Um, But I do have questions in each of the chapters for parents to work through. And I have three after each chapter. And so, for example, for this chapter, I wrote, um, for number one, it says, how can you remind your kids of the ways that divorce has benefit your family? If it's a fresh divorce, that may be hard to find. In that case, you may not know how to answer this one yet. And that is okay. Right. Um, And so just, you know, acknowledging each season of post and not the fresher seasons, it's it's going to be difficult to encourage your kids in that of like, oh, this was the right choice. Mm-hmm, Yay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but it will be better. And then number two, in what ways has divorce freed you to be your whole self? Number three, what are some of the stereotypes that you have heard when you tell others about your divorce and how does this make you feel? Um, and so another thing I talk about in the chapter is telling your kids like when they hear things like, is, oh, it must be sad in a broken home, blah, blah, blah. Telling your kids that they are the ones who get to decide what's broken and that their family unit gets to decide um, if they want to be termed with that, Mm -hmm. you Mm -hmm. know, thing or not. And so empower your kids that when they hear things like that to say, yeah, no, it does suck. Or, yeah, you know, it it hurt, but, man, we're much better for it and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And there's not a right answer in that. It's okay for your child to say like, yeah, it sucked and it fucked up my life. Like, okay, great. Mm -hmm. You know, if that's how you feel, that's how you Mm -hmm. feel. But there'll be moments where they recognize, wait, this might have been the better choice. Yeah. I love that, you know, it it gives the children the opportunity to decide for themselves whether it sucks or not. Right? Like, yes. um, like I, you know, it's the, the idea people are like, yeah, divorce sucks. And I'm like, well, I, you know, yes, of course it does, mm-hmm. but it, but, but it doesn't, but sucking doesn't have to be the definition, right? Broken doesn't have to be the definition. And as soon as we define it as a society, as sucking or being, you know, it's a broken family, broken home, then like we have, we don't give it space. Right. We don't we don't give it the opportunity to be anything else. Right. Oh, my gosh, Kate. Yes. Say it again. That's so good. (laughs) Yes. Right. Well, like we and also there's the weird thing in life where I've learned this with a lot of stuff, not just divorce, where something it's not black and white, like something can be very gray. Right. Like there can be awesome reasons like why the divorce happened. Mm -hmm. And yes, that was so right. That was so healthy. But then also there can be reasons where you're like, man, that really did suck. Yeah. Like that was bad. Mm-hmm. That was traumatic right. or whatever. But both can coexist. That's right. And it wasn't until I was in college where I realized like, wait, both can coexist. Dad's not the bad guy. Mom's not the good guy. Mom's not the bad guy. Dad's not the good guy. Like there is no verses or anything like right. that. It's there can be a coexisting of both. That's right. 
That's right. And that's, I mean, that's true for everything. You know, I always talk about like, there is no black and white, even in, you know, you know, my, my ex-husband as awful as he was to me in our marriage, he's also the guy who shows up and buries my mom's cat. He's also the guy who, Mm. when I'm sick, will turn up on my doorstep with a bag of lemons and some honey. Like, it's like, (laughs) you know, it's both and, and, you know, he is much more now that we're divorced, he's much more that guy. The guy who shows up and the guy who brings right. me, you know, who is generous and loving and of service and, and kind, you know, because we're divorced. He's actually gets mm-hmm. to be more that guy um, than the other guy. See, that's so interesting. Right? Yeah. That is so interesting. It's like he has the space to now. He does. Right. He does. Because we were, t- like I said, we brought out the worst in each other. I mean, he was also abusive. I'm not going to like gloss over that. But he, you know, he no longer abuses me. And, but even when he was, he was also, you know, this other guy, like it's, it's, it's never black and white. And that's what can be most confusing, of course, when you're in an abusive marriage, because, because it's not black and white, you're like, oh, but that nice guy, right? And that's the trap. But my point is, right, it really, it, it, it can be confusing and it is very difficult. And I think just developmentally, children, small children in particular, their brains don't process gray. Heck They no, are black and no. white and that's, but that's de- yes. developmentally appropriate. I'm, I'm an elementary school librarian right. and everything we teach in schools is black and mm-hmm. white though. Mm-hmm. Like there is a right answer. There's a wrong answer. When we're reading a children's book, it's very black mm-hmm. and white. Like they get together, happy ending. Yeah. Da-da this, da-da-da. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. just, and I think that's all of these cause and effect. Yeah. And I think it's, developmentally appropriate because that's the way their brains function but we could correct teach black and white gray i think you know uh more often yeah. and better perhaps than we do absolutely i um talk about in the book that like the whole scenario of a abusive co-parent mm-hmm. um is just completely different from what i'm preaching in the book. And so Mm -hmm. I try to remind the reader of that a lot Mm -hmm. of like, this may not work in your scenario Mm -hmm. and that's okay. Right. Yes. (laughs) And it may not be beneficial for your kid to do Mm -hmm. that because it could actually cause a blow up or a fight or, you know. That's right. When you're talking about, you know, advocating for, you know, teaching your kids to advocate for themselves, it may not be safe for them to do so. And so there are, Mm -hmm. yeah, it, 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 it does need to be, um, in context, um, and with some discernment for sure. Yeah. And I always remind the parent that like, they know their child best. Mm -hmm. And so these chapters are meant to inspire them, but they are not like a, you first do this and then you do this and then you do that. And then you do that. But rather like, this is what helped me. And I hope that these inspire you to take your situation and figure out with you and your kids. Okay. What's going to work for us. I love that. I love that. And that's, I mean, what a beautiful way to parent overall, right? And that's, you know, one of the things that I did with my son when I was actually advocating for him to advocate for himself with his dad, right? When I would say, listen, I, if I, if I bring this to dad, here's how he'll probably react. But When we were married and I had to deal with this kind of thing and I had to have these difficult conversations with him, here's what I found worked. And I found that it was really helpful if, you know, I started the conversation with something really loving and kind and nice, you know, basically buttering him up, (laughs) right? Butter him up, yep. (laughs) Um, You know, and I would would do that and say, yeah, that, that I would... Uh, give him the tools that I knew would work, you know, okay, or that I knew I worked. I love that you're my saying experience, that. Yes. Right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Because there's a difference. Like we talk a lot about, uh, I hear at least about, you know, kids saying, don't talk crap about the other parent. And that's so true. Like I, I say that so many times in the book of it's so toxic for you to talk shit about your ex in front of your kid. Mm-hmm. However, there's a difference between that and 
really empowering and coaching your kids through how to speak to your co-parent because you were married to them. So you know what ticks them off and what um, makes them upset, what makes them happy, yeah. what will make them, you know, react certain ways where the kid is still learning that. And so it was always helpful for me when my mom could coach me, kind of like you were just saying with your mm -hmm. son about not in a, oh, he's going to respond this way because he's the worst or blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But rather like this, hey, so sometimes I would do this yeah. and it would cause this and then enabled him to do this and maybe you could try right. that. Like there's just this very generous giving of, you know, here you go. Here's a strategy that works with this person that I have known for 25 years, <laughs> right? Yes, like, literally, like, literally. Hey, I know him yes. really well. And, you know, this is the yep. communication style that works best with him. For, give it a shot, yes. right? And like, here's a communication style that he doesn't really respond to well. And that's really yep. all you have to say is that it's about, you know, how they how they prefer to be communicated with, right? And it doesn't have to be like, your dad's, you know, an asshole, so you got to be careful and walk on these eggshells, right? This <laughs> but no, no, absolutely. Yeah. And I love how you mentioned, like, how you said that. It's about preference of communication style, mm -hmm. not like my way is the right mm -hmm. way, but the way you talk to him is the wrong way. It's like, okay, uh, uh, <laughs> right. Well, and and you know, in my world, communication really is like it really is about like the the person that you, you need to be speaking to the person in the way that they're going to hear it. Right. And you need, we need to be responsible for adjusting our communication for the person that we're speaking to. And what a fucking great lesson to give kids. Seriously. And that's what I did with yeah. my son. He was like, well, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't do that. And I, that's not the way I communicate. And I, and it was a great opportunity for me to be like, oh, okay, that's great. That's not the way that you communicate. <laughs> <laughs> but right, you right. have to be responsible for how people are listening and, Oof. you know, and who it is that you're talking to and how they tend to process and take in information. Right. And that's, again, a, a lofty concept for an eight year old. But, you know. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But, you know, I, I don't think it's I don't think it's actually too lofty. Right. I mean, there are ways that you can. um I don't know. There are ways that there, you know, it's like, well, you don't you talk differently to a, you know, to a cat than you do to a cow, right? Like, whatever. Yeah. Whatever. No, it's true. Or you could even make the example of like um, talking to your little brother who's five versus grandma. Right. Exactly. You wouldn't ask yes. grandma, grandma, do you need help eating your food? It's like, no, but your five year old brother might, uh -huh. or because that might make her feel demeaning like that might be demeaning mm -hmm. well same with your dad if you ask your dad this he might feel mm -hmm. demeaned by that comment so rather you can say this and this will make him feel this way you know totally so totally. thank you that's a I much don't know. better example ways. than the cat and the cow <laughs> <laughs> cat and cow you know do the animal sounds with them <laughs> no little brother and grandma was a much better example thank you <laughs> i don't know oh that came to me God. but no, you know no no, no. thank you Oh, gosh, so much. This is so great. What do you want to tell kids of divorce right now? Like if you were in front of a, I love you know, that. as a, as a, as a school yes. librarian, if they, if they were all in front of you right now and they were all kids of divorce, what would you say to them? I would tell them so much. I would say first and foremost, the most popular piece of advice, but it's true. I would say none of this is your yeah. fault. None of it is your fault. Mm -hmm. You are deeply valued and loved by each parent, mm -hmm. whether they show it or not. Mm -hmm. um, your parents decided to have you and you are here for a reason. Mom and dad will show love to you in different ways and both ways are correct. Mm -hmm. Maybe mom just gives you hugs and verbally says, I love you. And maybe dad just sends you a new iPad. Mm -hmm. Both ways are love and they're expressing their love in the ways that they know how. I would also tell kids that you're allowed to be mad. You're allowed to be upset mm -hmm. and you're allowed to not want to go over to the other person's house. Mm -hmm. um, it's frustrating when maybe mom lives in the main location near all your friends and your friend is having a birthday party but it's dad's weekend and you don't want to go to dad's because you want to go to your friend's birthday party. Mm -hmm. 
just say to the kids, it's okay to not want to be with dad that weekend because you want to be with your friends. It doesn't mean that you hate your dad. It doesn't mean that you're a bad kid. Mm -hmm. It just means that you're a normal kid who wants to go to the birthday party like everybody Mm -hmm. else. Tell your kids that or tell your parents that and let them know that you don't want to go that weekend and has nothing to do with them, has nothing to do with your love for that person, but rather you're just a kid. Mm -hmm. Right. (laughs) And I'd also tell the kids um, if mom and dad are upset about something with the divorce, it is not your job to manage their happiness. So many Mm -hmm. kids fall into the trap of taking care of their parents emotionally. Yes. And so I would just say courage your mom or dad to call their best friend or their sister or brother. But if they start talking to you, you can stop them and say, mom or dad, I can't hear this right now. I'm a kid who's trying to finish their math homework that's due tomorrow. (laughs) Right. Or yeah, like it's not my job to hold this for you. I love you so much. And I really hope you, and this is what we say as adults, like, I love you so much. And I hope that you can find the proper outlet to talk about this, but it's not me, right? Like we say that to our friends when they're not going to their therapist about things that they should be talking to a therapist about, and they keep coming to us with the same shit, you know, right? That's true. Yeah. And so, I mean, I think, I think most parents would, they would like the jaws would hit the floor if their child said that. But I think that is, it is important to know that you're, and that's what the parentification that we were talking about earlier. It's not your job. Yeah. It's not a child's job. And I would encourage parents to be really mindful of this um, and to make Mm -hmm. sure you do have the support of a therapist, of a coach. Hello. (laughs) <laughs> please, please, um, you know, yes. whatever it takes. It's so worth it. And it's, it's vital for your children. You have got to yes. have the outlets to be uh, processing this. That's not them. Amen. And also the kid has a developing brain, like we said earlier, and their brain will not be fully developed until they're 25. Meanwhile, you're probably over the age of 25. Mm-hmm. And so whether you like it or not, you are the adult. That's right. You need to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and get some help and not lean on your developing brain child. And even though I say in my book, too, that even if they seem mature for their age, like, oh, well, they're 10, but like, man, they're just so mature and they can handle it. No, No, they can't handle it. They might... They might seem like they can, or they actually may want to hear you talk about it because it makes them feel important or it makes them feel like they have a job, or maybe that's where they think that their love comes from is from listening to you. But that's actually like a twisted form of enmeshment and they cannot fulfill that job. And so it's up to you to draw the boundary because they can't draw that boundary yet. They're kids. They might draw it when they're in high school um, or college. And that would be a bummer for you to hear that after years of using them as your crutch. And now all of a sudden your crutch is taken away and you're like, wait, what? Yeah. I've leaned on you for 13 years. What do I do now? Right. Yeah. So right. rather than doing that, just stop it in the beginning and start using a counselor or a best friend mm-hmm. or somebody. Yes. Please just be a parent, especially for younger kids. You're not, they're not your best friend. It's not, it's not appropriate. It's appropriate for you to be Oh my a gosh, parent. Kate. Yes. <laughs> One time I posted a TikTok on my page that said, um, like when a parent says that they're besties with their child and it, it got so much weird feedback. Oh, like I got some people, sure. it was so weird. I'm, it was like, some people were like, oh yeah, that's so bad. Blah, blah, blah. My son hates it when my ex-husband talks about all of his girlfriends and how pretty they are. Yeah. And then another person was like, what are you talking about? I'm besties with my three-year-old daughter. We are so BFF. Blah, 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 blah. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is hilarious. Like it was such it's polar so opposite. It's so polarizing. It really is. It really is. But you know, it's no, you are a parent. Be a parent. And that doesn't mean mm-hmm. you can't have fun with your kid, by the way. <laughs> right? No, but they're not your no. bestie. That's another chapter in my book. I talk about don't lose the sight of um, having fun. Mm. Like just because divorce happened doesn't mean we need to be all melancholy now and let's all just be sad and let's be serious and all about divorce. Right. But like, don't forget your kids are kids and they need to have fun. That's right. And I, you know, I wanted to circle back to about like, you know, parentification and like making your kids responsible for your emotions. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't have emotions, right? Because 
it's also really okay to cry in front of your kids. It's okay to have yes. moments. Yes. What's not okay Absolutely. is to be crying all the fucking time and having your kids not have, like, because your kids need to know that everything's okay. And if you're, yep. and if you're constantly not okay, that's, that's absolutely scary. terrifying for a child. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's very, very scary. Yep. I interviewed someone on my podcast. She's 34 and she still titles. I mean, she is, she's a child of divorce, mm-hmm. but she's 34 yeah. and she's a parent herself. And she grew up feeling that she was responsible for her mom's happiness. Mm-hmm. But now when she cries in front of her son, she said, I'm very careful about what I say in those moments, because I want him to see me upset. I want him to know it's okay for mom to be mm-hmm. upset. However, when he hugs me, I tell him, thank you so much for your hug. I feel so loved by this hug. But you know it's not up to you to maintain mommy's happiness, right? And he's like, yeah. And she's like, it's not up to you to cure mommy's happiness. But I love it when you give me hugs. That's mm-hmm. so nice. And just explicitly saying that to him. And yes, he's only four years old. But she's explicitly saying that to him now to hopefully plant a seed to let him know later in mm-hmm. life that it is not up to him to maintain mommy's happiness. That's right. Amen. Amen, sister. Oh my gosh, Grace, you're so wonderful. (laughs) I have enjoyed this conversation so much. I think this book is, is it, so tell, tell everyone where they can find you, where they can find the book and follow along with all the amazing things you're doing. Yes, ma'am. So you can find me on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, all under the name at divorce tips from kids. Mm -hmm. So divorce tips, plural um, kids. Um, and then the book you can pre-order as of today on Amazon, which is so exciting. It officially comes out June 20th, but you can pre-order it on Amazon. There's also going to be the ebook version, which is available and the audiobook. So if you are not quite a reader, but you do love to listen to things like this, like a podcast, mm-hmm. why don't you just get the audible version? Yeah. And is it you? D- did you read it? Yes, I Perfect. read it. Good. I'm glad. Yeah. You get the full Grace Casper experience. Yes, I love it. I love it. So divorce tips from kids and the book is called Dear Parents, Notes from a Child of Divorce. Great. And you can pre-order that on Amazon right now and it will be available and sent and shipped out to you on June 20th, 2-0. It's a Tuesday. June 20th. Awesome. It's going to be the best Tuesday of your life, you guys. <laughs> Just buckle up. I mean, no also, doubt. Also, one more plug. I forgot to say this, but I do host a podcast myself, which I will have Kate on soon, Yay. called um, Divorce, What I Wish My Parents Knew. And I interview other children of divorce because I'm just one child. That's right. And children have a lot to say about their experience. And so if you want to know about a 25-year-old who's a man who just found out his parents are getting divorced, that's available on the podcast. So there's tons of experiences and different stories um, on that podcast as well. So good. So good. Grace, thank you so much for being here. This has been an absolute pleasure. You are just so eloquent and mature. And, you know, look, if all of our kids end up like Grace, I think we're, I think we're going to be okay. Girl, <laughs> golly, you're empathy. Oh, thank you. It was an honor being on your show. You're such a fun host. Oh. So I just seriously bucket list item is checked off today. Amazing. Amazing. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Divorce Survival Guide podcast. If you like what you hear, head on over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen in and leave me a review. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at the Divorce Survival Guide. I'll see you next time. And until then, remember, you, my love, deserve to be happy.